uh, and we move on to the next uh, talk by thank you everyone Yes, Professor Tishankar Rajchudri, can you please uh, share your screen? Yes, yes, the screen is visible. Um, yeah, okay. can you see the, yeah. Yes, and, yes. Uh, can you see the mouse, or the cursor? Yes, yes, uh, we can see the pointer, yes. Okay. So, hello everyone, we are uh, in the second talk of the morning session. Uh, it is, uh, the speaker is Professor Tishankar Rajchudri from NCRA TIFR, and he will be talking about studying the first stars using neutral hydrogen. Over to you, Professor Rajchudri. Thank you. Thank you, Dhiraj. Uh, let me start by thanking Sriram and the organizers of this meeting for giving uh, me a chance to talk about this work. Uh, I mean, since this is uh, probably going to be the only talk on, on reionization and first stars, uh, I will try to go slow and explain as much as I can. If something is not clear, please feel free to interrupt and uh, ask whenever uh, uh, you want. So uh, let me start with the movie, which many of you would be familiar with. This is just showing the large scale structure and uh, it's particularly at high redshift. This is of course a simulation. Um, and uh, what uh, you would realize is that the universe really progresses from a very homogeneous kind of a state to uh, something where the, the structures uh, become quite prominent. So you can see all these uh, cosmic webs and filaments. And then there will be places which are, you can see some whitish points. These are the places where uh, the dark matter will collapse and form halos. And these will be the places where the galaxies and the stars would form eventually. So this is how the large scale structure uh, looks. Uh, that's what we believe at, at uh, high redshifts. And one of the kind of frontiers of modern cosmology is to go and detect signatures of these large scale structures at very high redshifts. In particular, if possible, the first stars and the galaxies. Now, how do you do that? Uh, if you want to detect these first galaxies, let's say the first sources in the universe which formed at some very high redshift, redshift 20, 15, we don't know when. You can try to do that by observing directly. This is what we do at low redshifts uh, using our ground-based and space-based telescopes. Of course, they have probably reached the limit uh, we, can, we can do with them. So probably uh, the first test will be directly detected, if at all, by the, the upcoming telescopes like the JWST and the extremely large telescopes. Of course, JWST is not upcoming anymore, it's there. And maybe we will start getting results, uh, very interesting results in the next few months. So, so fingers crossed there. Now, these direct detections will always have this problem that they would be biased towards objects which are intrinsically bright. You will detect stars and galaxies at high redshifts, but you will preferentially detect the brighter ones. So suppose you have detected a few of them, initially, you won't know whether how representative that sample is. Maybe there are a lot of faint galaxies which are there, which actually dominate the population, and we are not able to detect them. I mean, we'll eventually probably go there, but initially there will, will always be this confusion. So it is always good to have complementary probes. And one of the complementary probe is to study the effect of early galaxies through what happens in this cosmic web, the matter in outside the galaxies, in particular, the hydrogen there. And this is where the concept of hydrogen reionization becomes very important. So the term reionization. And let me just again try to explain what I mean uh, uh, through another movie. So here what is shown on the left is the same uh, n-body simulation, which probes the large scale structure of the universe. On the right, what is shown is uh, another movie on the same matter field, but of the neutral hydrogen distribution in the universe. Neutral hydrogen often uh, astrophysicists call it H1. So often I will just interchange neutral hydrogen and H1. So please, uh, uh, I hope you can follow that. So uh, now the point uh, to note here is that 
Uh, on the right, uh, the points which are red are basically neutral hydrogen. The regions which are blackish are devoid of neutral hydrogen. And you will see as the move, universe tends to go from this red to black. That is the hydrogen is getting ionized. Why are they getting ionized? They are getting ionized because stars are forming. These stars are producing ionizing radiation. And once this ionizing radiation come out of the host galaxy, they will start ionizing the hydrogen in the surrounding medium and hence all these black regions. Now, if you look carefully, you will also realize is the black regions grow, I mean, appear first at places where there are more galaxies. So I don't know whether I will be able to do that, but let me try to uh, stop the movie at some place. Okay. Yeah, maybe here. Yeah. So what you will realize is that, I mean, uh, if, you, if you look at a place which is like full of uh, galaxies like here, you will see those regions have become like much blacker and they would have become blacker earlier. Whereas regions which are far away from galaxies, those regions have remained neutral, that is red. So the other way of saying is that this distribution and evolution of neutral hydrogen in principle can trace the formation of galaxies and stars in the early universe. So in this probe, you don't have to go and detect individual galaxies or stars. If you can find a probe of neutral hydrogen, some probe, which is sensitive to the amount of neutral hydrogen, you can learn a lot about when the first stars formed, how were they, how did they evolve, and so on. So this is where reionization connects to the first stars and to cosmology in some sense. And that's something which I want to discuss. So the main points of discussion in this talk would be, uh, what are the kind of physics uh, which we need to know to uh, understand reionization? And what are the, their connections to cosmology? And that would lead us to some idea about parameter estimation. How does reionization affect uh, estimation of cosmological parameters? And here I will try to highlight some work done by our group. And I will talk about uh, some future prospects. So let us just jump into the reionization physics. And that's something uh, which I want to spend some time on. So physics of reionization, the starting point is these dark matter halos. So at low redshifts, I mean, in our local universe, the way we think is that there are stars, there are galaxies, and this galaxy is like surrounded by a big dark matter halo. What actually happens is this, these dark matter halos, this concentration of dark matter, collapsed dark matter objects, they form first, and their gravity actually pulls all the gas towards them. And then basically that gas, if, if the conditions are favorable, will eventually form the galaxies. So the starting point is dark matter halo. So you need a model for dark matter halos. How are they, I mean, when are they forming? What are their mass distributions and so on? Now the next step would be all this complex uh, gas physics. Basically the gas will be in this dark matter halo and then uh, you have to understand if the gas can cool, uh, can they fragment into like molecular clouds and eventually can form stars. Ah, even if they start forming stars, are there processes which can prohibit future star formation? That's called feedback and so on. So there is all this complex physics of galaxy and star formation, which, which one needs to in principle understand. Then comes, okay, stars have formed, but what kind of stars are there? So you need to understand the stellar spectra. And in particular for ionization, you need to understand how many ionizing photons, hydrogen ionizing photons are these stars producing? Are they producing any or are they producing a lot? And then there is this crucial part that, okay, let's say the stars are very efficiently producing hydrogen ionizing photons, but are they coming out of the host galaxy? Because the galaxy, as we know from our uh, local universe, the galaxies, the interstellar medium contains a lot of neutral hydrogen. And maybe that's where they get stuck. I mean, then nothing comes out uh, of the galaxy. 
So this is called escape of photons from the galaxy, and this is something which is very poorly understood, both observationally and theoretically. And in case the photons cannot escape from galaxy, the whole reionization picture is in trouble. I mean, then, I mean, okay, there are ionizing photons; they are trapped in the galaxy. The galaxy hydrogen is highly ionized, probably, but the universe, the bulk of the universe, remains neutral. So this is something which is uh, which we don't understand. So we know that the universe is definitely reionized, but uh, if the photons cannot escape from galaxies, then we have to look for other sources. And then the final ingredient in reionization physics is that the photons assume the photons have come out from the galaxies to this cosmic web, this large scale structure, the gas there. Now you have to do radiative transfer. You have to allow these photons to propagate. To, through this intergalactic medium, and uh, that now you have to keep on solving for this. So you will realize there is a lot of complex physics which go in, which also spans a wide range of temporal and spatial scales. So it's not very easy to model each and every aspect in their full glory. Okay? So that's that's something uh, to take home. Broadly, people divide this reionization studies into three blocks. Of course. It's not to say that these three blocks are completely unconnected, but roughly speaking, these are these three blocks. The first block is this cosmology and structure formation, the nonlinear structure formation, which tells us how these dark matter halos form. The next one is this galaxy formation and the interstellar medium and what happens inside the galaxy, basically. And the third one, again, is has to do with uh, like astrophysics. It has to do with radiation and how that travels through this intergalactic medium. So these three blocks are, I mean, and, 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 uh, are, I mean, are ingredients of reionization physics. And there are two more blocks which are not often uh, very widely appreciated that you can have reionization physics, you can have a very good theoretical model, but then you have to connect to observables, something which the observers can go and see. Uh, in principle, you should be able to compare with uh, observed quantities, and that would also lead to statistics. So you have to do a reasonable statistical analysis to compare these models with observations. Great. Now, since I talked about observables and observations, so that is that was the part like the theoretical part of the reionization. Uh, how do we probe uh, reionization, and how do we know that this process has happened? So there are basically two, I would say, main or direct observational probes of reionization. One is Lyman alpha absorption of UV light from distant quasars by the intervening neutral hydrogen. This is known as the gunn peterson effect. This probe directly studies the amount of neutral hydrogen in the universe. The other probe is the scattering of CMB photons, something completely different. So scattering of CMB photons by free electrons, which are produced during uh, reionization, because reionization ionizes the hydrogen. It breaks the uh, hydrogen into a proton and electron. So there will be a lot of free electrons, which will scatter the CMB photons. Now, this probe is complementary to the Lyman alpha probe, because this probes the ionized component of the universe. So one is sensitive to neutral, the other one is ionized. So this combination in principle can be very useful in probing reionization. There exist many other probes of reionization, but they are somewhat indirect. So for example, observations, direct observations of higher trip galaxies uh, through uh, telescopes like uh, HST and then follow-ups using the, the large telescopes, uh, VLT and Keck, and the ones, we, uh, the ground based ones. Then, for example, the temperature of the intergalactic medium, and uh, so on. So, there are many such uh, probes one can think about. Uh, just a quick aside in this talk, uh, I will be talking mostly about reionization. There is a phase of the universe which precedes reionization that's called cosmic dawn. That is also very interesting in its, uh, and it's becoming very interesting, but I'm not going to cover that uh, just to keep it uh, like focused. So let me quickly tell you about these two probes and in slightly more details, so one slide each, let's say. So the Lyman alpha absorption spectra of quasars, uh, you, can, you can see from this cartoon, there is a background source, the quasar, you can think of that as a torch light. The light is coming from the quasar towards us. And it's passing through the intervening gas. And depending on how much neutral hydrogen is there, 
in the intervening medium, it produces all these absorption uh, signatures. So all these absorption signatures is appearing because of Lyman alpha transition of hydrogen. And in principle, those, uh, uh, those absorption lines will tell you how much neutral hydrogen is there. This, for example, shows some representative quasar absorption spectra at different redshifts. And you should concentrate on this part. You will see at lower redshifts, there's virtually no absorption. And then as you go to higher and higher redshifts, the absorption increases. So probably signaling uh, 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 increase in neutral hydrogen at higher redshift. So, and then uh, by the time you uh, end up at redshift six, you see this part is completely absorbed, okay? With some few transmission, some spikes. So the nature has completely changed. So clearly there is more absorption at the high redshift. Uh, so probably there are more uh, uh, neutral uh, hydrogen at high redshift. However, if you do the actual calculation, what you will be able to show that the observed quantity, uh, uh, I mean, if you think of them as the, think of it as a transmitted flux, that is given by exponential of minus optical depth. That's the Lyman alpha optical depth. And the Lyman alpha optical depth turns out to be 10 to the five times the fraction of hydrogen that is ionized. Uh, a fraction of hydrogen that is neutral, I'm sorry. Hello, so now, there is a question, sorry to please. interrupt. Uh, yeah. uh, Sriram, can you unmute and ask? Uh, Directly? Yeah, I just uh, uh, what in earlier you had mentioned that the galaxy, the photons have difficulty emerging from the galaxy, right? What hinders these photons coming? And uh, uh, yeah, and there should be, a, you know, uh, this is about reionization, as you were just mentioning, you should be able to absorb in uh, detail the 21 centimeter emission, which reflects the earlier epoch. Yes, okay. I, uh, so I will come to 21 centimeters separately later. Uh, so, and uh, but about your first part of the question, so escape is hindered by basically neutral hydrogen inside the galaxy. So you have produced photons, which in principle can ionize hydrogen, but let us say they're all absorbed inside the galaxy because of the hydrogen there. Now, uh, I mean, in that case, it, uh, almost none or very few photons will come out from the galaxy. Now you can ask what actually helps these photons in escaping from the galaxy. So there is no consensus here. One um, uh, theory is that the hydrogen inside the galaxy is extremely kind of patchy. So there are kind of regions which are kind of uh, tunnels, basically low density regions through that the photons can escape. The other has to do with like, if there is a supernova going on, there will be winds going out and that will basically clear some path and the photons can, can escape from there. So this, all this clumpiness and outflows are very, very important uh, in understanding the escape. Okay, thank you. And I will come to 21 centimeters separately as future probe. So currently, I mean, I'm talking about the current probes and the current probes are really Lyman alpha and the CMB. And as I was trying to tell you that imagine a universe, which is for example, highly ionized, that is one part in 10 to the four ionized. So then this fraction will be 10 to the minus four and this tau will be of the order of 10, e to the minus 10 is still a very small number. And you will end up getting something which looks like this, uh, complete darkness. So that complete darkness, just by looking at it, won't tell you whether the universe is neutral or is it ionized, okay? So you have to do a bit more. Now, what is clear from this, anal this kind of uh, spectra, is that the universe needs to be highly ionized at redshifts less than, let us say, five. At least that part is clear because we see a lot of uh, radiation which is coming from the quasar to us. So clearly, the ionization fraction has to be less than 10 to the minus four. It's, it's probably of the order of 10 to the minus five or so, or even less. So clearly, reionization is a process which got over by redshift five, and the universe below redshift five to today is very highly ionized. Now, the Lyman alpha absorption not only sets the end stages of reionization, it also tells you the amount of ionizing radiation present at the end of reionization. So you can end reionization at five or 5.5 or something like that, but you have to end with the right number of photons. Otherwise, you won't be able to match these observations. And this is a subtle point, which is not often appreciated in the community. 
The other aspect of reionization is through CMB. So basically the CMB photons are traveling from the last scattering surface to us. And as it is passing through this ionized universe, uh, it's, it's the, the, the photons start to get scattered. Uh, and that scattering is basically Thomson scattering. The Thomson scattering has an angular dependence and hence can redistribute the angular pat pattern of the CMB anisotropies and can give rise to polarization. And the main quantity of interest is that optical depth, the Thomson scattering optical depth. That is nothing but the integral of the free electron density along the line of sight multiplied by the Thomson scattering cross section. So this is an integrated quantity. Now what happens is uh, one can try to go and measure this using CMB angular spectra. The tau, it turns out, is very strongly degenerate with the amplitude of the primordial power spectrum. So this has implications for cosmological parameter estimation. And this is the tau which goes in as a free parameter in the standard uh, cosmological parameter estimation codes. This tau, of course, has the measurement of taus, uh, of course, has a very turbulent history, I would say. So, I mean, the first like reliable measurements started to come around 2000, early 2000 from WMAP. And they ended up giving us a value of tau, which was very high. Uh, that actually indicated that reionization happened earlier than what we expected at that time. But later, after Planck data started to come, they realized that, uh, of course, WMAP probably didn't do the foreground cleaning uh, uh, too accurately. And now the kind of consensus value is much lower uh, than what WMAP says, used to say. So, uh, now, fine. So you have this physics, you have this uh, observation. So now you have to be build a model which can capture all the physics, give you the observables, and then you, you fit uh, and then see uh, what is allowed and what is not. Now, uh, as I said, I mean, the, the uh, problem is highly nonlinear. It, it covers a wide range of scales. So it leads to different approaches in modeling. For example, you can try to do with full numerical simulations where you can include most of the physics, but they are uh, extremely expensive computationally. You have to really go to very, very, very like expensive clusters and, and, uh, and, and very few groups uh, in the world uh, can actually access those. The other extreme is you can do uh, everything analytically or let's say semi-analytically. These are of course will be extremely fast models and they are appropriate for parameter space ex exploration. But then you cannot solve all the non-linearities in their full glory. So what you have to do is you have to make approximation. You have to introduce efficiency parameters, fudge factors and so on. And then you hope that you will be able to marginalize over all them to get some sensible parameter constraints. Somewhere in between comes something called semi-numerical model. These are still simulation, but these will be like simulation boxes, like volumes, the, like the pictures I showed, the movies I showed, but they won't be actually solving the full nonlinear equations. They will still be applying some theoretical approximations on top of that. So this is, this is somewhere in between these full numerical simulation and some analytical models. In this talk, I will concentrate on the analytical and semi-numerical ones because I want to connect uh, the reionization to cosmological parameter estimations. And that clearly you realize cannot be, can, that clearly cannot be done with full numerical simulations. Now, suppose you want to do reionization constraints uh, and you want to include that in your cosmological parameter uh, uh, estimation analysis. And let's say you want to do it using analytical models. What will you do? A standard, let's say, if you if you if you are happy with the six parameter flat lambda CDM model, what you would do is you will take the interesting data sets. CMB would be the obvious ones, but you can supplement with other data sets. And then you will vary some six parameters: uh, omega matter, omega baryon, uh, the Hubble parameter, the amplitude of the power spectrum, the the slope of the power spectrum, the primordial power spectrum, and tau. Tau will be another free parameter. I mean, in actual analysis, you may not be varying exactly the six parameters, but some combinations of that, which are more useful, but essentially this is the six parameter model. Now, if you want to include reionization, what will happen is tau will not be a free parameter anymore. Tau will be replaced by your reionization model, and that will bring its own uh, parameters, its own efficiency parameters and whatever other nuisance parameters. 
but the thing you gain is you are now you are able to compare with more data sets like lamb and alpha absorption and other data sets if if they are there and here uh, our contribution has been a new code uh, which we named uh, cosmo reion mc so the name suggests that it does cosmology and reionization parameter estimation using a mcmc method the core component is a physically motivated analytical model for reionization which i started developing with andrea ferrara uh, like almost uh, 20 years back and that kept on uh, being developed and later on uh, one of my earlier uh, phd students saurav mitra is a faculty now so he uh, took it forward and then he could couple this code with uh, codes for cmb uh, angular power spectra computations like the cam and then later this is more recent where we could couple this with the mcmc module based on a popular code called uh, cosmo hammer so this allows the whole thing to be coupled to planck likelihoods and any other observational data of cosmological interest in addition to reionization data and it's a very uh, like easy to use uh, code written in python so this the later part of the work was done by uh, my PhD student, um, Otridev Chatterjee, who is like about to finish his PhD, and, and we have just uh, published that. And we hope that we'll make it publicly available in the near future once we are sure there are uh, no bugs and it's, it has, it's easy, easy to install and so on. And this uh, is a quick uh, plot uh, which shows what happens if we include reionization observations into the analysis. So uh, just ignore the blue uh, curves for the moment, just concentrate on the greenish regions and the red regions, which are hardly visible, but they are there. Now the greenish regions are the analysis which are done using only CMB data, okay, the CMB TTT data. And the red regions are where we take the CMB data, but we also include the Lyman alpha absorption data, let's see. So you can clearly see, and these are basically the standard corner plots for various cosmological parameters. And you can clearly see the moment we include reionization data, the parameter space shrinks. So let us concentrate on a particular combination just to pick one. Let us say, how does the tau and the parameters for the, the, the relevant for the power spectra look like? And if you look at that, you will realize that, for example, the constraints on AS have become much tighter when we included the CM, uh, the Lyman alpha uh, absorption data in the analysis. And that is because the tau itself has become uh, quite uh, restrained. And that is happening because we have put in information about the reionization process. And this is how these uh, analysis will work. I mean, if, if you include more data, hopefully your parameter space will shrink okay now of course remember the tau is a derived parameter for cmb plus lime and alpha whereas it was a free parameter for the only cmb analysis but there are caveats also i mean there are free parameters which we have taken and there are priors on them and you can ask whether those priors were broad enough whether the assumptions we made were valid or not uh, do they evolve how do we know how they evolve the mass dependence the environment dependence all these astrophysical complications are there so these caveats will we'll always have to keep in mind and we have to figure out that in spite of these caveats, what kind of constraints do we put? So this is the kind of uh, state of the art analytical models uh, and cosmological parameter estimation we have now. What will happen in the future? And that uh, there, uh, the 21 centimeter will play a big role basically. So 21 centimeter radiation is nothing but the hyperfine transition of the hydrogen ground state. So this also is appear, uh, uh, arising from new hydrogen when it is neutral, just like Lyman alpha absorption. And but this happens as a very different frequency. So this happens at like 1.4 gigahertz in, in the rest frame of the atom. Uh, of course, by the time it reaches us, it would be that shifted to lower frequencies. Uh, so the target is to detect this signal using uh, low frequency radio telescopes. And there is a, like a worldwide effort going on. So if you think of the observational probes of the 21 centimeter signal, I can divide it into like two broad classes. One set of probes is trying to detect the globally average signal. So this is like the whole sky average signal. This would be something like um, Kobe de detecting the 
the, the black body nature of the CMB basically. So it's, it's a sky average signal which one is trying to detect. And then there are some uh, instruments which are trying to detect the fluctuations on top of that. Okay, so that would be like what you see the CMB fluctuations uh, on top of that uh, homogeneous background. So uh, instead of CMB, this is happening for the 21 centimeter. For the global signal, I mean, there are various uh, uh, instruments and I've just plotted, some, I mean, shown some representative ones. There are many others uh, which are trying to detect the signal not only from reionization but from cosmic dawn. I mean, so this is the edges. The signal became very, very popular and controversial. And this is the SARS, and now they have the SARS 3, which has given out results. So this is an instrument which is based in RRI in India, and there are others. And then there are, uh, and what you realize is this instruments for global detection are much simple. Okay, there are, there's just one component, one element, uh, something. Whereas fluctuations would require interferometers, an array of telescopes. And again, there is a wide uh, range of telescopes, MW in Australia, LOFAR in Netherlands and Europe, GMRT, which is near Pune here, again, an Indian connection. And then there are others which are trying to detect uh, the signal at much uh, higher frequencies. Now, suppose, again, uh, Suppose we stick to the global part. Now, what I would uh, have uh, like to mention is that when you do analytical modeling of reionization, you will be mostly stuck with globally average quantities because uh, otherwise it's very difficult to solve the equations. So if you are stuck with globally average quantities, then for the 21 centimeter signal, the relevant quantity will be the globally average signal. Of course, uh, I mean, we don't know whether the edges signal which came out was true or not. So we, we don't want to like, uh, I don't want to spend time on that. What I would like to show is that suppose in the near future, there is a global experiment, which gives you uh, a signal over a wide band of frequencies, then what would happen? So here, basically, it's a forecast of what will happen if we add the global 21 centimeter data on top of what we already have. And here you will see, uh, you, know, you have to look at this violet purple kind of patches. Again, the parameter space shrinks compared to what happens now. So with the 21 centimeter data, the parameter shrink, uh, space will shrink further. And if you want to just focus on again, this tau versus the, the uh, power spectra uh, parameters, you will see that the constraints are expected to become much uh, narrower when the 21 centimeter data uh, comes up. So this is where the 21 centimeter will play a big role. Now, I mean, since this is a conference uh, mostly directed to uh, the uh, gravitation and the cosmology community, let me again summarize, is reionization important for cosmology? So suppose you want to do cosmological parameter estimation and just want to study the large scale uh, features of the universe, do you need to worry about reionization? What happens is the formation of the first structures, the first dark matter halos and galaxies would depend on the matter power spectrum, particularly the smaller scales. Okay, So if you think in terms of K modes, they have to be like larger than of the order of one uh, per uh, Komovin megaparsec. So reionization modeling and observation can in principle affect the constraints on the primordial power spectrum, particularly at small scales. Reionization in that sense can also probe extensions to the concordance cosmological model. Any extensions that in principle affects the small scales power spectrum. For example, if you, if you think about the, the nature of dark matter, suppose you say it's not really wimp, not cold, it's rather warm, that will introduce a cutoff at small scales. Uh, in principle, that will delay the formation of first stars in the universe and will affect your value of tau. So maybe the reionization uh, you, uh, uh, observations can help in constraining them. Similarly, other light dark matter particles, the primordial magnetic fields and so on. Reionization effects are also degenerate with extensions to concordance this six parameter model that affect the large scale angular, uh, large angular scale uh, CMB power spectra. That is because the polarization signal from reionization appears at very low L values, L of the order of 10 or so. So if your primordial power spectrum uh, starts affecting uh, these scales than what is traditionally taken, 
that uh, may have some implications for uh, i mean the reanalysis observations may have some implications for constraining those models okay? so what has been shown here is basically the te power spectra uh, uh, angular power spectra versus l and the reanalysis signal appears here of course the challenge here is that there are a lot of uncertainties in the galaxy formation and this reionization modeling, which appears as parameters and fudge factors. And our lack of knowledge of those parameters can often weaken the constraints on these cosmological models. So, uh, so that is why we need to kind of complement uh, all these uh, studies with very detailed models of reionization and galaxy formation so that uh, we can actually, for example, suppose we have a very good understanding of reionization, we can probably constrain tau independent of uh, other things. If we can get a better prior on tau, that will start constraining the other cosmological parameters much more. So this is how one way of looking at it. Now, in the next five minutes, I want to quickly go through uh, what next. I mean, so this is all you can do with an analytical model with globally average quantities. But then this, this, uh, there's a lot of information beyond these globally average quantities. That is the fluctuations in the ionized field. What I've shown here is another two movies. This is basically the same reionization. You will see these black regions appearing, growing, and then kind of overlapping and reionization being completed. Now I have taken two different models here. The left one is a model where reionization is driven by faint galaxies which are abundant. And on the right one, I have taken a model where realization is driven by very bright galaxies, which are rare. So I have kind of killed the faint galaxies by hand. And I have tuned all the parameters in such a way that both the models produce the same global realization history. In other words, all the analysis I talked about till now won't be able to distinguish between these two models in principle. But now you will be able to see if you look at the fluctuations, they look really, really very different. For example, uh, if I if I come here and stop, let's say at 7.3, these two universes have the same globally average properties. However, you can see the, the, the actual nature of these ionized regions are very different. The right panel has big ionized regions, but few of them. And the left one has many ionized regions, but small of them, so that they add up to give the same number. Now, the question is, can we distinguish between these two models using some observations? Of course, those observations now have to probe the fluctuations in the field. It turns out that we have already started probing the fluctuations. For example, the same Lyman alpha absorption, which I showed earlier, has now become like the data has become so good that we are starting to probe the fluctuations in the absorption. For example, these are two absorption spectra, which I showed earlier, very close to uh, like retro five and six. And suppose I break the spectra into chunks, and these are chunks of the order of, let's say, 40 como wing megaparsec. So these are cosmologically representative, but not very big. And the question is, are the statistical properties in these chunks same, or are they different? Now, again, by I, you will realize that for the uh, redshift 4.76 squares are maybe the statistical properties are very similar within these chunks. However, they are very different in this squares are. I mean, some chunks show a lot of spikes and some chunks show complete absorption. Of course, one has to go and do the statistics properly. And it turns out that indeed, as you appear, uh, approach redshift 6, there is a lot of fluctuation at, in the Lyman alpha absorption. Now they are pro probably probing the have, final uh, stages of realization. Yeah, thanks. Okay. The other probe has to do with again CMB, but now we are talking about the kinetic Sunaevzel of which effect signal from patchy deionization. And that has to do with the fact that these free electrons or these bubbles have a velocity, a line of sight velocity with respect to us, and that will basically change the frequency of the CMB photons. Again, the these are basically uh, signals appearing at much larger L of the order of thousand, few thousands. And the ground-based uh, uh, CMB probes uh, have started to detect this signal or to measure this signal. And there are other probes of patchiness in, uh, in reionization, that's uh, temperature, uh, the Lyman alpha emitters, and so on. And of course, the future will again be 21 centimeter experiments, but not the global one now, but the 
the, the fluctuating part. Then there could be uh, constraints coming from CMB B mode polarization because this patchy uh, reionization will give rise to B modes and so on. But now, in terms of modeling, you cannot anymore do with uh, these simple analytical models. You have to go to either full numerical, but then you cannot do parameter space exploration, or you have to come to semi numerical where you will make approximation, but you will probably be able to do uh, parameter exploration. So now it depends on what you want to do. Now, let me uh, not spend too much time on this. This is too much details about semi numerical codes. And because I put this slide, because this is where I'm spending a lot of time here. But the main story is that the conventional semi numerical codes, which were based on excursions and formalism, were very popular and very efficient. But it turns out that they, uh, they have some uh, difficulties, which have to do with photon conservation and uh, the convergence of the results. So they are not numerically convergent with respect to re resolution. So probably going too technical. So what we have done is we have come up with a very different way of semi-numerically uh, simulating reionization. And we have now a code called script. I won't have time to go into the details of the script, but this is where I'm, I'm spending a lot of uh, time nowadays. And I will give you some like one result where, where we think that this, this kind of codes can play a big role. So what we have done is we have taken this semi-numerical code and tried to get constraints on reionization histories from Planck and the SPT measurements of the KSZ signal. And these are the kind of reionization histories which are allowed by these two experiments. And so these are present uh, constraints. And now we do the same analysis, but now what we do is we do it with Lyman alpha absorption without those fluctuations we showed. But again, we can do parameter space exploration here. And these are the kind of uh, kind of ranges we get on the ionized fraction. So what has been plotted here is the evolution of ionized fraction with redshift. And you can see ionized fraction goes from very low values at higher redshift, that's neutral universe, to an ionized universe. Now you see with CMB, we got some constraints, but the moment we put in, the Lyman alpha data, clearly many of these models are getting ruled out. Now, where we are stuck is that ideally one would like to combine these two analysis and do it together. Now, in principle, that is doable, but what happens is uh, there are various technical problems in combining these two kinds. So these, uh, these analysis require two very different kinds of simulations, basically. So this is where we are currently spending our time. Uh, of course, we haven't varied the cosmological parameters here because these are simulations. So uh, varying cosmological parameters means you have to run the simulation from scratch again. But we plan to do that at some stage. So this is something which is going to happen in the near future and going to spend some time on these. Of course, here also, as I said, the future will be the 21 centimeter fluctuations. And what will happen is this 21 centimeter fluctuations will give rise to a power spectrum. And as uh, the power spectrum of the neutral hydrogen uh, as the, the reionization progresses, this power spectrum will also evolve and hopefully one will be able to detect with, with the upcoming uh, interferometers like the square SK uh, shown on the left and HERA shown on the right. So these are two uh, telescopes which are coming up. SK is of course interesting for us because it is a very ambitious radio astronomy project uh, and, and India is a multi national project where India is part of that. And of course, we have been involved in the SK from the very beginning and, and, and we have been doing, uh, contributing to the science case a lot. Uh, so that brings me to the end of the talk. So basically I will try to convince you that uh, the first stars and hydrogen shift universe can be studied using hydrogen reionization. And this is, can be very important in studying the cosmological model and its extensions, uh, possible extensions. Most of the present constraints arise from the globally averaged reionization history at present, but we expect further constraints from the fluctuations in this ionization field, but those require fast and accurate numerical simulation. So this is where a lot of effort is being spent, not only by our group, but worldwide. And our uh, contribution in this direction is a, a quote called script. It is of course publicly available. So people who are interested are free to uh, try it out. So yeah, I will stop here. And if there are uh, there is time and uh, questions, I will be happy to take them.
Thanks. Thanks a lot, Professor Ajudri, for this uh, excellent talk and a great overview of the uh, reionization. Uh, please, yes, uh, we have some questions. Um, let me ask um, uh, Nishikan. Uh, you can unmute and ask the question. Yeah, uh, so th uh, thanks for the excellent talk. I had one question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I saw that uh, there were some of these ionized regions which were appearing and disappearing. Uh, so is it because uh, the sources were very weak uh, or uh, uh, or they had a finite? Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. Is. Yes. No, no. This case. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, this worried us a bit. No, the sources were not weak in this case. So this is happening because of a weird region reason. See, I'm plotting a slice and some of these sources have peculiar velocities, which are, let's say, perpendicular to this slice. And they are probably at the edges okay. of this slice. So at the next epoch, suddenly it's going out of the slice. And the way I have plotted it is, I mean, it's taking the whole uh, bubble with it. Okay, okay. okay. So there is a combination of peculiar velocities and the way I have plotted. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so in any case, I mean, yeah. I mean, often these two D slices uh, are uh, misleading uh, once in a while. Okay. So, yeah. But this is but, the main. But is it relevant to ask that uh, these sources uh, will uh, not be shining, or at these redshifts anyway, they are very bright and they are growing and uh, will be always. No, 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 no. Your point is absolutely valid. They are bright but they could be very transient because one expects the first set of stars to be very bursty. Okay, so they may be living for 1, billion, uh, 1 million years and just goes off. Okay. And since they are rare, there may not be anything coming up nearby. No, uh, but, but this is redshift uh, 10 or so. So these are not first stars, right? These are first galaxies. No, no, no. I mean, of course, uh, 10 it is not, but uh, okay. around 15, this could be the case. Okay. And I said, and this redshift, these are not. Uh, that okay. is not the case. Okay. But at Redshift 15, we need to worry about those things. Unfortunately, okay. we haven't done that. Uh, currently, I mean, as long as the halo stays, the star formation stays. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Sharvari? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I had a sort of general question. You showed um, these uh, sort of a flow chart, uh, uh, right? You have probably first or second slide of various components that go into a code, right? And I suppose different codes uh, treat each of these uh, steps differently. But what is the which of these steps would you say is the least well understood? I mean, which would contribute the greatest error in sort of if you just come not across codes? I mean, uh, yes. each code may treat it independently or uh, to a greater precision. But overall, I'm yes. So of course, the best understood in the whole game is the dark matter halos, the cosmology and structure formation part. Part. The least understood, I would say, is the escape of photons from the galaxy, because even at low redshift, we don't have much idea about what is how, how this is happening and what's going on. Though things have become much better, I mean, our understanding have improved over the last like few years, I would say. And then what happens is in reionization modeling, I mean, if I come from the reionization community, people treat this block as one black box and one kind of efficiency parameter. I mean, they hide everything inside this efficiency parameter. So even though many of these things are uncertain, they can just uh, kind of put it under the carpet and be done with it. And this is done in full numerical simulations as well as like the analytical models. Of course, this is th these are very interesting problems for the galaxy formation community, but the reionization people kind of uh, just just don't worry about these things. Mm -hmm. So for the reionization community is the ready rip transfer, which is the challenge. And it is a real, real challenge. And here the idea is what you do is you run many, many galaxy formation models with all their uncertainties. But for each of them, you produce the, the, the neutral hydrogen observables, be it uh, CMB, be it 21 centimeter and whatever. And then you start ruling out or accepting galaxy formation models. So to do that, you need a very good handle on the radiative transfer, uh, not only in terms of accuracy, but also you should be able to run these codes many, many, many times. So the reionization community is spending a lot of time in this last part. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. Also, so since you mentioned this, you said that uh, if sometimes the photons may not escape from the galaxy, and you have to look for other sources of uh, photons. Yes. What? Yes. So the next obvious source people it's think about. Right? I mean, currently there is no evidence that the photons do not escape. So even if a few percent escape, we will be probably be okay. But if they really don't escape. Then the next suspect would be something equivalent of quasars. People call them mini quasars. So these will be something like accreting black holes in the centers of these early galaxies. Whether they existed or not, we don't know. But they will be able to produce a lot of ionizing photons. Okay, so it's a controversial thing, but maybe that is something we have to look okay. forward to. And then if that doesn't work. Then we have to go to more exotic sources, like some dark matter annihilation happening, which is producing high energy photons, and that is reionizing the universe. Because we know that the universe has reionized. Now, all these models will produce, I mean, the, the fluctuations will be very different in these models. So that is why the study of fluctuations become very important. So the reionization was with the galaxies will be very different from reionization with quasars. And these will be very different from reionization happening, let's say, with dark matter particles, some exotic dark matter particles. Yeah. Uh, Kandu, okay, you... thank you. Is that time? Otherwise, I think. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe a brief question from you and Raghu Kandu. Please go ahead. Oh, okay. So, Tirk, um, if one really wants to constrain cosmology, then probably this. Ionizing regions are too much. I mean, one should probably go back to before the ionizing took place and everything was seen in absorption, but there are density fluctuations. Yes. Do you agree? And how, what's the prospect of that? Yes. So, Kandu, what you are talking about are the dark ages, basically. This is before the first stars formed. And all the neutral hydrogen were tracing the underlying matter distribution. And if we can go and measure the power spectrum there, and preferably at the various redshifts or some measure of that, that would be the ideal case for um, uh, cosmology. I agree. The thing is, that is at much lower frequencies. So people don't expect that to be done using ground based uh, radio uh, facilities. So the idea is to send now radio telescopes in the sky Tomorrow. and that too you have to send to the other side of the moon to avoid the interference from the earth. Okay, so so okay. there are plans, there are uh, proposals submitted uh, like in US and so on, but this is like really, really far future. Okay, thanks. I'll talk to you later more. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Tate. My question is the opposite of Kandu's question. By a very long shot, is it possible that in the future, with some bright ideas, this can help us tell us something about the nature of dark energy, which is very low redshift? Yeah, yeah. So, no, it is very difficult, Rogu. What happens is, uh, if you don't have uh, uh, anything, dark energy doing anything at these redshifts, that is, let us say, redshift between redshift 15 or 6, I mean, at those redshifts, what happens is all models tend to the Einstein dissipator, basically. It's an omega m equal to one universe. And then, yeah, it, it becomes extremely insensitive to the dark matter, uh, uh, sorry, the dark energy uh, physics uh, at these stages. So the only uh, things I know people have tried with doing is uh, like exotic early dark energy models, but even there, the success rate is very low because of these uh, strong degeneracies with uh, astrophysics. So, yeah, but uh, as you said, we probably need uh, some bright idea, which currently I, I can't think of any, but uh, something to probably scratch our brains uh, at some point. Thanks. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, let's thank Professor Rai Choudhury again. Thank and you. let's thank uh, both the speakers of uh, this session.